Hi, and welcome to the webinar for co College Readiness, Teaching Students with Intellectual Disabilities and Developmental Disabilities, um, Getting Ready for College. We appreciate you joining us on the webinar today. My name is Kendra williams Dean, and I am the director for the Zero Center for Learning Enrichment here at the University of Oklahoma. A little bit about the Zero Center. The Zero Center was founded in 2000 by a very generous donation from the Zero family who reside here in the state of Oklahoma. The purpose of this center is to provide educational opportunities and outcomes for students with disabilities. So we spend a lot of time helping teachers, helping students, and doing research in order to help those students with disabilities be successful um, both during their school setting K through 12 and after their graduation and they go on to their post secondary endeavors. So again, thank you for coming to the webinar teaching students with intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities college ready skills. This webinar is sponsored from the Zero Center for Learning Enrichment, but we would not be able to do this webinar without the three programs for um, college programs for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We have with us Texas A&M University Aggie Achieve, the University of Iowa UI Reach, and also the University of Oklahoma Sooner Works. And so each one of those programs and individuals associated with those programs will um, be providing information as the webinar continues. We also want to um, thank Think College. Um, a lot of the information presented in this presentation today was, um, was obtained through the Think College website. So we will definitely be talking about the resources that they have today. All right, the first thing I want to do is allow each one of our speakers a moment to introduce themselves and tell a little bit about themselves. So first on the docket is Texas A&M University and Aggie Achieve. Good morning, uh, my name is Dr. Olivia Hester. Uh, I am the program director for Aggie Achieve at Texas A&M University. Uh, super excited to be joining all today. Um, Aggie Achieve just started this past year and you'll learn more about our program towards the end of the presentation. Um, prior to this, I worked for about five years at the University of Alabama uh, with the Crossing Points program, which is a similar uh, post-secondary program for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Hi everyone, or as we say in Texas, howdy. My name is Dr. Carly Gilson and I am the faculty director for Aggie Achieve and the founder of the program. So I've been working on um, starting Aggie Achieve since I arrived to Texas in 2017. And before that, I was um, a graduate student and worked closely with the Next Steps program at Vanderbilt University. Really happy to be here with you all. Um, just like Kendra said, I started out as a um, middle school special education teacher and uh, have sat through a lot of boring professional developments and hope that this will not be one of them. And so we really are excited to sh share more about our program as well as share more about college readiness. Thank you. Jennifer, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, I'll go ahead and... Uh... Uh, my colleague Lauren Bruno will be joining us uh, in a little bit. She's coming from uh, another program. So I'm Jennifer Kramers. I'm the Career Development and Transition Coordinator at UI Reach. Uh, we just celebrated our uh, 10th anniversary for our graduating class. So that was pretty exciting um, at our virtual convocation uh, last week. We have um, about 48 students in our program. This will be my seventh academic year that I'll be starting. At UI Reach, so um, I've worked within their academic and their um, career planning departments there. So we'll talk more about the program later on in there. But I'm really excited. A lot of what I've done uh, in my past is with the teacher preparation program at the College um, of Education at the University of Iowa, and then uh, going on my seven years at at UI Reach. So um, I've had a lot of interaction uh, with the teacher prep program and with the um, special education teachers in our state. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. 
Right, so as Jennifer mentioned, um, Lauren Bruno is on another call at this moment. I think she's going to be joining us in about 30 minutes or so. Um, Lauren Bruno received her PhD from VCU. She is currently a postdoctoral research scholar um, at the University of Iowa working with UI Reach um, and has accepted a faculty position at Washington State University to begin there in the fall. Mindy, you want to go ahead and go? Yeah, my name's Mindy Lingo and I'm the program coordinator for Sooner Works at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, we just started the program last year, so I was finishing up my graduate studies. And so the last year of my graduate work, I was doing the, I was program coordinator. Um, but really I worked on getting Sooner Works all through my graduate studies all four years. I feel like um, it was quite an endeavor, but we finally got it and very excited to have it. Um, I, like many of the others, was a special ed teacher for 15 years, taught the gamut from elementary to high school. I've taught um, students with more involved needs and students with just very mild needs, but I think my heart really lied in working with students with intellectual disabilities. Um, so it's been perfect. I have a specialty in transition, and so just pairing all of that together has been the um, Sooner Works has been the perfect avenue for all of this. So we have assembled a, a great team here today who is very knowledgeable in the expectation that college programs have for students with intellectual disabilities as they transition them from that high school setting into the post-secondary setting. So thank you all of our speakers for introducing yourself. All right, so here is just a quick overview of our agenda today. We're going to first talk about college programs for students with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities, some of the things that are out there. A large part of the presentation will be spent on what is the educator's role and what can teachers very specifically do to help make our students with intellectual disabilities college ready when they leave high school. We have some time saved for resources. There's some definitely wonderful um, educational resources, curriculums, study guides, things that are out there right now that can very easily be incorporated into a high school curriculum. So there's absolutely no reason to reinvent the wheel. There are great resources out there. And then we also wanted to save a little bit of time to allow the three programs that are with us today to present some specifics they have on their program at their respective university. All right, so first let's talk about college programs for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Interestingly, this movement specifically for students with intellectual disabilities is relatively new in the whole scheme of things. In 2008, some legislation changed that allowed for the first time students with intellectual disabilities to be able to qualify for a lot of federal assistance in paying for college. And so with that, there sparked a whole lot of interest in what can college programs provide for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Kind of before this 2008, there was definitely a lot of interest in 18 plus programs. So you started seeing a lot of students who were still in high school, but maybe they were being educated on a community college campus or an actual college campus with their same age peers. And through this movement, we really started realizing that there is a whole lot that college does to help shape typically, um, typically developing students into adults that our students with intellectual disabilities so desperately need as well. And so what we have now are college programs that offer transition focused opportunities on college campuses for our young adults with intellectual, develop, intellectual and developmental disabilities. The programs that definitely follow best practice are providing academic supports are providing career training supports, and are also providing different levels of independent living skills support. And the idea is college is this amazing 
you know, four, maybe five or six year opportunity that our typically developing students have to take advantage of. And it really helps shape them and mold them from I'm primarily a student living in my parents' house, functioning as a child to I am now primarily functioning as an adult. And it provides a lot of natural resources and a lot of natural supports. The idea of going from a parent's house into some kind of university living dorm setting, and then from that into an apartment with friends is a very natural progression. For, for typically developing students. And so why not provide these opportunities, these natural progression of development to our students with intellectual and developmental disabilities as well. Okay, so this is one of my favorite slides that I put, I think I put it in every presentation I do just because it really represents the importance of why we're doing these programs. Um, this was a, published in 2018 by Smith et al. And they took a sample of students that were participating in a uh, Department of Rehabilitation Services, not students, I'm sorry, young adults. And so the students that were not participating in a post-secondary program, those that were just receiving um, vocational rehabilitation services, only 30% 36% of them were living on their own, 38% had paid employment, and 28% had community engagement. But then when you added in the post-secondary program for students, they were, so these students were doing the post-secondary program and also receiving DRS services. Those numbers jumped, 71% were living on their own, 78% paid employment, and 90% community, community engagement. And to me, that's just, huge. That's really our focus of post-secondary programs. Those are the skills we're working on daily. I mean, these are these are the outcomes we're looking at. And I really, from all the studies out there and the information that's coming out of Think College, are this is pretty comparable across the board of a lot of the programs. And at Sooner Works, we don't have numbers yet because we're just in our first year. Jennifer may be able to provide some numbers on how Iowa's doing, but I know that when these students are leaving college, their gainful employment is huge. Jennifer, do you have numbers? Yeah, we have those um, coming up in our slides that we have for REACH. Uh -huh. we, we just completed uh, our most comprehensive alumni survey, and we were able to um, contact uh, almost 90 plus percent of our alumni over the last 10 years to get those, those numbers. So our Paid employment is at about 88%. Um, and we even have that broken down by uh, wages and benefits. So oh, that's awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you just think about, oh, you know, traditionally, you know, and this is kind of a common question that we get asked a lot is what is the benefit for students with intellectual disabilities to go to college, and this is really the benefit. Um, there's increased rates of living um, more independently, there's increased rates of employment and increased rates of community engagement, which we know all of this coupled together um, results in a, an increased you know, engagement in life and a higher quality of life. Okay, so Think College is our national coordinating center for post-secondary programs, and it's really my go-to for everything. Anytime I have a question, anytime I'm wondering how to do something, um, I direct parents there. It is a wealth of knowledge, and in a little bit, I think Olivia is going to go over uh, the Think College resources for you, but we just wanted to introduce you to it, so when we're talking about it, we'll bring it up several times throughout the presentation. That is our national coordinating center that provides guidance, resources, and research pertaining to the development and preservation of these programs. And it was founded with the um, 2008 higher, uh, uh, sorry, I had a little, uh, the Higher Education Act, sorry. Okay. I got a little sidetracked there. So the Higher Education Act, in 2008 set aside funds for Think College. And like I said, it is a wealth of knowledge and I encourage you all to go check it out. All right, 
so this kind of comes back into the what exactly does college provide and i've had you know several teachers ask me what is it that college programs for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities can provide that high schools can't provide and and it does get blurry there are amazing high schools with great programs um, out there and great transition programs that really can provide a lot. And there are also some high schools out there who just due to resources are providing, you know, kind of that same high school experience for for students. But when you really think about what it takes to move from being, you know, a student where you're primarily you're living at home, your family and your caretakers are doing a lot for you into being that independent adult there's a lot of things that go into it you know and one of the things i talk about that things we can do on the college campus with our students with um, intellectual disabilities that we can't really do in high school is because it's our students responsibility to go eat dinner at home your parents may serve you dinner your family may cook you dinner but when you're on the college campus it's your responsibility to go eat no one's going to tell you to go eat it's your responsibility to make sure your alarm is set so that you can wake up in the morning to go to class now do we have supports absolutely but at the end of the day it boils down to it is that individual's responsibility to make these things happen and college really provides this atmosphere where students really learn to start balancing multiple roles and multiple expectations put upon them. They're starting to balance what does it really mean to be a good student and what does it really mean to be a good employee. And so one story that came up and we're definitely changing all the names in our stories. And so we had a student who was trying to balance that role of social and how much time do I want to spend with my friends and what do I have to do in terms of my academics and trying to navigate that. This particular student had joined a fraternity and very much wanted to spend all of his time with his, his peers in a fraternity and wasn't quite as interested in doing his internship over the semester. And so students are having to make those decisions of, okay, do I want to go to this place with my friends or do I need to go to my internship? And in high school, students aren't forced to make these decisions quite the same. You go to school, you're there from eight to three. Uh, maybe you're there in the afternoon for extracurricular activities, but you're not forced to actually make these decisions. And it's through the supportive nature that college programs can provide that students are able to navigate, well, what happens to my internship if I choose to spend too much time with my friends? Well, if I'm not going to my internship, I'm not going to have a job or I spent so much time with my friends. I didn't get my schoolwork done. And so they're really having to navigate a lot of these adult roles, but definitely with supports to make sure they are successful. Of course, our end goal for our students is we want meaningful employment. We want meaningful community participation. We want students to be self-determined. There is a lot of research out there that shows that students with greater levels of self-determination have greater adult outcomes. So the more you're able to advocate for yourself, the more you're able to make your own choices, the more you're able to decide what you want to do and put those things into practice, the greater outcomes that you have. And we also want our students to be lifelong learners. We want them to be engaged citizens in the community that they live in. So the next portion of the presentation is getting into educator roles. You as teachers, and I think, um, in the, in the results, about 75 to 80% of the individuals who had registered for this webinar described themselves as educators. We also have a good chunk of parents. So definitely parents are critically, critically important in making college a reality for our students with intellectual disabilities. Um, but that this webinar particularly focuses on educators. And so those educator roles are vastly important. There's, there's a quote that your belief and expectations have a greater impact on a student going to college than the student's actual skills 
um, an ability that they have. And I wholeheartedly agree with this quote from Think College that when the adults, whether the educators or the parents in a student's life believe that they're going to go to college, when they expose that student with developmental disabilities to college, the impact of that and the student's rate of going to college greatly, greatly increases. There's a lot of things that we can do to help make up for lack of ability. Technology is fabulous. We're going to talk a little bit about technology later and the importance of smartphones and the importance of commute computers and that kind of stuff. But there's a lot we can do to make up for any kind of lack of ability. But there's not a lot that we can do to make up for the lack of desire. And so when a student wants to go to college and wants to be successful, that goes a really, really long way. And in order for that to happen, the educators and the parents and the other adults in that student's life have to instill that and really foster that desire to go to college. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about the individual education program, or as um, I was a teacher in Texas, um, I'm totally good talking about the ARD. In fact, sometimes ARD rolls off my tongue a lot easier than the IEP, even though I've now spent years trying to train myself to say IEP. So the first thing I want to encourage you to do is make a goal in the student's IEP that says this student is going to attend college when they graduate. Make this part of their annual IEP. Definitely when students are 16 or in the majority of most states, 14, and that transition component of the IEP is now required, make sure that going to college is on that IEP. So um, a little story for you, and this is a story of a student that I was actually working with and the student wanted to go to college, um, had probably right there kind of at that borderline IQ um, between having an intellectual disability and, and not, but the student was very adamant that they wanted to go to college. They had taken Spanish one and passed it, but when they took Spanish two, they were not successful in passing Spanish two the first time they took it. The student sat there in the IEP meeting and said, I want to take Spanish two because I know that if I take Spanish two, I'm not gonna have to take any foreign language when I go to college. The student was a phenomenal advocate and had amazing parental support. But when the student said this in the meeting, the meeting shifted from a position of, we just want to give this student classes that they can pass and we want to get the student to graduate. The meeting focus shifted to we now need to prepare this student for college. And so when you talk about college and you have a goal for attending college, it really does change the focus of the IEP meeting because it's not so much let's get this kid graduated, let's make sure we have all the credits, but it becomes a conversation of let's make sure that this student has the skill set that they need to then be successful in the college setting. We also have transition activities. So you've got your goal that specifically says, we're going to attend college. This is my post-secondary transition goal. Um, and then we have transition activities, the things that we can do to foster that goal into happening. So we definitely need to focus on self-advocacy. We definitely need to focus on college. That student who said, I need Spanish too, knew that because that student had parents that helped, excuse me, helped them research what they needed in order to be successful at college. And so all of these things come into play when you have the goal talking about college and the transition activities line up to that goal. Now, we would not be doing justice to this presentation if we didn't talk about the absolute importance of parental involvement. Um, parents and family members are the person who is going to be with that individual with an intellectual disability from birth all the way to the end. And so parent involvement is absolutely critical in making sure 
that the reality of going to college happens and helping to plant that seed. So we need to get parents involved early. We need to educate parents about all the different options that are available to students with intellectual disabilities. So when I was a high school teacher um, a long time ago now, um, college really wasn't an option for my students with intellectual disabilities. We talked about career tech. We talked about, you know, maybe some community college options. We talked a lot about employment options. College is now an option that is available in all 50 states for students with intellectual disabilities. And it's something that we as educators need to involve parents to make sure that they are also aware that these opportunities now exist for their children. So the next three slides really kind of get at a lot of specific college expectations and definitely what high schools can do to help facilitate these. And so I know, Jennifer, you're taking the lead on this. So let me know when you want me to advance slides. Yeah, sure. And I think we can all chime in on these. Um, I think these are really exciting for me because uh, with my work at REACH, I have also um, coordinated the admissions process. And part of coordinating the admissions process is um, meeting the families and the students and the transition teachers. Um, of the students uh, that are looking at our program and having those folks come to um, come to college. So one of the things that we talk about in that admissions process are uh, IEP goals and we get students anywhere from sophomore year in high school to you know um, out of high school. So developing those IEP goals with that annual goal of attending college, I think is the most important thing, um, uh, message that, that you shared in that last slide. And the reason for that is, and I, I've talked with folks at Think College about this as well, is a lot of, um, of families and uh, educators want to have the academic goals of writing and reading and math. Um, and sometimes those transition goals take a back seat. And it's really important that college is the goal. And if that is the goal, then the transition goals need to take a front seat there and need to have an emphasis. Um, it helps with our admissions process too when a student does have transition goals that we can see that they have skills and that they've made progress. And so I think that assists the students in their goal of getting admitted into a college. Um, but these are all things that students can easily work on um, in their high school experience and transition program to prepare them for post-secondary. So you can see from the slide, um, navigation and transportation is super helpful for students that you can do um, in a secondary setting to prepare students for college. Um, creating opportunities for students to plan their free time. Our students, you know, live in the residence hall. They have um, lots of unstructured and unsupervised time in the evenings and weekends and are making a lot of uh, independent decisions on how they're going to spend that time. So having that opportunity uh, in a secondary setting um, is, is really important. Um, students being able to self-identify disability, we spend a lot of time on that and we talk about that in our admissions interview with our student. Um, for them to be able to advocate for accommodations that, that they need is, is important. Um, dining centers, so sometimes we'll have a parent um, concern that their student is only going to choose uh, pizza for breakfast, lunch, and dinner in our dining halls, and uh, they certainly can because <laughs> there are college students who do that. Um, so I think giving students those adult decisions and independent decisions and sort of releasing some of that responsibility is really important in that secondary setting. Um, it's, it's difficult if a student's never had those independent decision-making opportunities and independence until they come to college that can be overwhelming. So I love the idea of it becoming more structured within um, the IEP. It, it, um, it has that gradual release, which I think gives students some structure and some comfort. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Yeah, and I was gonna add on, Jennifer, you know, in terms of the dining center. And so I, I like <laughs> to say this, the University of Oklahoma has the only all-you-can-eat Chick-fil-A in the country. 
And so our main dining facility for our students has a Chick-fil-A booth and you literally can eat all the Chick-fil-A that you ever wanted. My, I have teenage boys and they ask to go to our dining center for their birthday so they can have all you can eat Chick-fil-A. But this is kind of, you know, and as Jennifer was saying, the ability for students to go in there, buy their own lunch, consider healthy choices, how much is an appropriate amount? So one Chick-fil-A sandwich, no big deal. If you're eating four, this is probably not socially appropriate. And these are these things that our college students are navigating. So the more of a head start we can get on what does a balanced meal look like? You need some green food on your plate at some point. These are a lot of the choices that the more we can do in high schools and help students make healthy choices, the more set up they are to not just eat, you know, pizza or Chick-fil-A at every single meal. So, Kendra, I have to say I'm really glad that we do not have an all-you-can-eat Chick-fil-A <laughs> on our campus. Like, dodge the bullet with that one because, you know, and it's similar, I'm sure, with y'all's programs. Like, we can encourage healthy eating all we want. But at the end of the day, it's up to the student to make those decisions. We can't tell them, no, you're not going back for your seventh slice of pizza. They're adults and that's how we treat them. And also they go to the dining halls by themselves or with a group of friends. And, um, and so, yeah, choice making is huge. And especially for students who haven't had that opportunity before in making decisions on what they're eating, they tend to overeat and overindulge. Um, and again, it's up to them, you know, we can supply them with all the information of how to eat healthy, but it's really their choice. So, but yes, I'm really glad that we don't have an all you can eat. <laughs> that would just be disastrous. It's, it's interesting. Although, you know, who doesn't like Chick-fil-A, so. <laughs> all right, so slide is all on academic preparation. I think, Jennifer, you're still on this one, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, so one of the other things that we do is we, um, we actually have one today. We do uh, tours and uh, meetings with educators who want to learn more about our program. And part of that is providing them with this information and resources. One of the resources um, I'd recommend is on the Think College website. It's, uh, I think it's a, called IEP goals for preparing students for post-secondary education. Mm -hmm. And we have teachers uh, that come absolutely love being able to walk away with some concrete resource like that. And I think when um, we're talking with educators and parents about creating these transition goals with post-secondary education, going to college as, as an annual goal, it's a little overwhelming on what some of these um, goals can look like. So I think these slides are great examples along with the Think College um, resource as well. They have goals specific to education and training, employment, community participation, adult living, services, and daily living. And these are all really great examples. Um, I think the theme here is just having students making decisions on their own. Um, practicing in that supported secondary environment on how to advocate for the accommodations, how to access their syllabus using checklists. Um, you, if you guys want to chime in a little bit about some of the specific um, technology. Yeah, um, well, this is not necessarily that specific, but I also really want to talk about the importance of including our students with intellectual disabilities to the maximum extent possible that makes sense for that students with yeah, their general education peers. Inclusion is a huge, um, or just being in those general education classes, there's a lot of times different expectations. The ability to, you know, and of course some of our high schools get really, really large, but the ability to move from one classroom to another independently within a five minute bell changing period really teaches a lot of skills. So I think the more we can push inclusion in general education, there's just some different expectations that come along with that as well. And I'll say um, as far as communicating with instructors, um, that really does fall on the student and with the program because um, in college, your students are falling under the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which is FERPA. Um, and so they are deemed um, the sole owner of their educational rights and records, uh, meaning that you as a parent cannot contact the instructor and ask, how did my student perform on their test? 
uh, you can't even contact the program and ask that. Um, so a lot of the communication is going through the young adult, um, and we really advocate for that um, so that the young adult is becoming more independent and is taking on, taking on that responsibility. Um, and that's also a huge adjustment for parents, um, especially coming from the school system. They're used to um, teachers contacting them if something comes up or um, you know, letting them know about how they're doing in classes and things like that. And that's just not something that is, um, is allowed at the college level. Um, and so that's a huge adjustment um, for families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So some other examples on how um, in a secondary setting we can uh, help build those skills for students to make that transition to uh, being successful at college in that post-secondary setting. Just continuing to build those opportunities for students to um, develop their own weekly schedule. Uh, we have students now that are using their Outlook calendars and accepting meeting invites and you know it's taken a while to get there but they're really um, using those tools to um, manage manage their schedule, their academic and their social schedules, which has been great. Um, our students also are able to access our campus recreation center. And I think that having those opportunities again in that secondary setting helps the students build uh, kind of those, uh, those skills that they can carry through when they get to uh, campus. Students uh, exploring interests in high school, or community clubs. I think everyone here on their college campus can share that there is a, almost a, an endless list of clubs and social opportunities that, that students can uh, participate in. We have over 500 clubs at the University of Iowa and, and if somebody sees one that, or wants one that's not on there, they can certainly create one. We had students this year. We previously in past years had a guitar club and we had a student that had been on that a guitar club for three years and then the um, the folks that kind of supported that club uh, graduated and then so it kind of fizzled out because they're student led and uh, he was disappointed in that so we had an incoming uh, freshman that was interested in in starting the guitar club back up so those two students in our program resurrected the University of Iowa guitar club and uh, got that back on its feet. So um, that was really neat to see the students do that. And so just exploring interests um, and having that community engagement with their peer group, I think is, is really powerful for, for the students um, in the, and having that inclusive uh, experience. When we share uh, these types of, of goals with uh, teachers and families, I think it's really motivating as well for the students because then they can kind of picture themselves in that college setting. And sometimes I think that can be a barrier uh, because students might not be able to picture themselves. Uh, it's not something they've necessarily thought of. So I think having students visit college campuses and in different inclusive post-secondary education programs, wherever those might be, uh, it's really powerful for the students and for the families. Um, and I think that could be, you know, a goal that's part of the student's um, transition plan. We have a lot of students who visit programs throughout the Midwest um, and throughout the country. And I think it's, it builds in them the uh, perception that they are uh, college ready. They can go to college. And it really motivates them when we give them kind of those list of activities and list of skills that they can start working on because they can picture themselves here. So I think it can be motivating. It's also helpful, uh, I think, for families because they can start saving because there can be some financial barriers to programs as well. So I think the earlier you start in, in high school in your transition plan, not only do you have a longer time to build uh, your skills for the transition to post-secondary ed, but you also have time to prepare for um, the financial as well. So it's super uh, exciting to have parents and teachers come visit, a, uh, visit us and, and get their feedback on that. Um, I would say probably, you know, the majority of our students don't have a transition or a post-secondary goal. And so I think this is exciting that, that we have this opportunity to, to reach so many people today because I think it's 
Uh, probably the best indicator of a successful transition to post-secondary ed is to have those transition goals. Um, and don't be afraid uh, not, you know, not to have all the reading, math, writing, all those academic goals. If the student's goal is post-secondary education, we need to think about um, these types of skills that students need to be successful in that environment. Yeah, that's actually um, a great segue, Jennifer, into the next slide. Um, you know, and as Jennifer was saying, don't be afraid to not have all of those academic skills. There is so much that technology and computers and smartphones and the desire for wanting to be at college will overcome. Um, that sometimes the focus on reading and writing, in fact, that's one of the most common questions that we get here um, at OU is what reading level does this student need to have? And I really hate to even put a number on it because the actual reading level can be different from the comprehension level, can be different from this. And the truth is, I don't care if a student uses a screen reader to read their content of what they're reading or if they read it themselves, as long as they've listened to it and digested it. And so there is so much you can do with technology to overcome barriers of academics. But if you want to go to college and you want to be successful in this arena, work on the transition skills, work on the ability to navigate walking from class to class, work on the ability to be able to live independently, work on those kind of transition skills, because we have such great technology these days that a lot of those straight academic skills can actually be made up for with the use of technology. So one thing that is really important now here at the University of Oklahoma, we have tons of computer labs. And so there is definitely not a shortage of computers that students can have access to. However, most of our students do have their own device and they just get used to it. We're all kind of a little territorial, so to say, of the computer that we're used to using. And so definitely our students with intellectual disabilities get very used to the format they're using. But these are things that we expect students to be able to know how to do. Check email, send email, read email. And so professors, their number one way of communicating with students in their classes through email. So if class is canceled unexpectedly, the professor is going to send an email out to the class to say, hey, unexpectedly something came up, we're not going to have class today. Students need to have the ability to check that email and say, oh, this has happened. Professors will send email to change due dates. You know, I'm pushing back this due date from Monday to Friday. Students will need to have their email in order to get a lot of that information from the professors. So the more that high school teachers can use email to communicate with students just kind of sets them up for accessing information and interacting with professors through email. Now one of the things we've also had to work on is the tone of an email to a professor is very different than the tone of an email to a friend, but you know these are things that we can definitely work on. Other computer skills that are really important is opening documents, downloading documents, being able to save documents and know where to retrieve them. And so one thing, you know, that we definitely do is, and we'll kind of talk about this later, is within all of these programs, we're going to modify the curriculum to make sure that it's accessible and appropriate to the students in our program. Um, but so let's say instead of writing a five page paper, students are writing a one paragraph paper. But if the student doesn't have the ability to start the word document or start the word processing document, save it, retrieve it, attach it to a file to turn in, these are some of those computer skills that become really, really important. And these are things that definitely Typical college freshmen come to college with the expectation that they can do that. And the same thing with our students with intellectual disabilities. They need to come to college with at least the knowledge of. Do we help them? Absolutely. Um, I can speak for Mindy that she has spent many appointments, you know, walking students through, okay, now which button do you click on to attach this file here? But these are the things that we definitely um, 
are looking for students to know how to do. And these are the transition skills. It's not the what reading level can I read at skills. Um, also, we talk about the importance of smartphones. And so smartphones are absolutely um, amazing. I'm sure if I took a poll for all the people who are watching this, this webinar right now, you know, probably 98% of you have a smartphone. And it's probably infiltrated like every part of your life. Jennifer was talking about earlier, students making calendars and using Outlook and incorporating all of these things that they're probably accessing through their smartphone phone. You can set alarms, you can set reminders, you can access bus schedules, you can access work schedules, of course email and all of these things are through your smartphone. Um, texting is the number one way that our students communicate with their peers and that's all done through their smartphone and so there is so much um, accessibility that happens right there um, with their phone. But we need, students need to know how to make a phone or make a call, charge their phone, add content, contacts, make notes. And it's also a great tool. And so this is a, this is a true story. One of our students um, class was meeting in a different building one day and she got lost. The University of Oklahoma campus is fairly big, and so she got twisted around trying to find a building that she had never gone to before. So what did she do? She called Mindy. Mindy, I'm lost. I can't figure out where to get to this building. So through FaceTime, Mindy and this student got to the building that she needed to go to in order to, to meet. The, this, the class was actually meeting at the student health center that day. And so she was able to walk to the correct building, but it was all through this FaceTime technology. But the student also had the concept to say, I'm not sure where I need to go. I need to get help. I used my phone. I called my help support. And so these are all the kind of things that we really want students to have when they get to college in order to help make that transition seamless. But the, this, you know, and smartphones are, are kind of funny because of course I'm sure we've all seen the tables of college students sitting around and everyone has their phone in front of them um, and they're not even talking to each other. But smartphones are like this attachment to college you know, that age group this year. And these are really the expectations that we have for students in order to, to use a smartphone. Anyone want to add anything? I can add um, a couple things. The importance of, I, I think what's so cool is that the path of technology and the growth has really followed the growth of um, inclusive higher education. And so yeah. As educators, there's so many ways that you can start to um, support students' use of technology. I think computers, um, you know, are in a lot of high schools and classrooms now, but a lot of times, you know, think about how you might tell your students to put their phone away or not to use it, not and and um, treat it as though it's something that's only an escape rather than a facilitator and um, Smartphones have really replaced a lot of uh, assistive technology and the need to have assistive technology. And now um, that a lot of these accessibility features are built in right on the devices themselves. And so they can become a natural support where they can blend in with all the college students sitting at the table who are staring at their phones. And this is something that at Aggie Achieve, we've recently built into our admissions process where um, when our students come for the, the final interview day before we make formal offer, we build in tasks that are all of the things that you're seeing on the screen. So we want them to, we want, we want to not only know that their teachers and they and they, their parents say that they can do these things, but we actually want to see it because there is going to be that situation. We have, we walk them through a scenario just like the one Kendra described where you're lost on a big campus. What do you do? We have them use Google Maps to get to and from a location. And you really do see uh, what, where students are and how ready they are for this because they're going to be learning so many new things when they come to college. So if they have a device that can help them navigate the complexity of college campuses, of communication, all of that is so, so integral. And 
you know, recently, uh, as I'm sure many of you had to do, we had to make the switch to uh, virtual programming and online classes. And um, we were just so blown away by how uh, quickly and easily our students responded to that because they had this background knowledge. You know, something that was not on the, um, the computer one, but probably should be is how to use Zoom and how to participate. <laughs> Um, <laughs> which I think we're all learning today, <laughs> but how to participate in a video call because that's a completely different um, way to participate in a meeting or in class than attending a class. And, but the same etiquette still applies, that same um, expectations. And many of our students you know, are used to having things set up for them, but the more that we as educators or parents can start to encourage independence and having them go from a blank screen, trying it out to uploading a Word document or to opening up a Zoom call. All of these things are things that you can build into their daily routine and test over time so that by the time they are assessed on it, if they um, come to one of these programs that they'll be ready to go. And I think that for um, teachers who are sitting there thinking, my students can't afford a smartphone or an iPhone right now, um, try getting some iPads for your classroom because the iPad is very similar to an iPhone. Um, and so practicing those skills on iPads that you have in your classroom is another great way to um, allow students to have that access. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great suggestion, Olivia. Okay, so the next few slides that we're gonna go over are definitely going to talk about resources that we definitely wanna make you aware of that these things are out there. And so the first resource is of course, Think College, which is an amazing resource. Yeah, so y'all have heard us talk about Think College several times during this already. Um, so I challenge you after this webinar, or maybe you've already done it on another <laughs> window, but go to thinkcollege.net. Um, and they have so many different resources for families, for educators, for students with disabilities, um, and for programs. Uh, we all use Think College um, for so many different reasons. Uh, Think College is one of my favorites on my computer. I'm going to it all the time. Um, it is our coordinating center. And um, if you go to College Search on their website, it looks like that screenshot right there. Um, there are 295 college programs for students with intellectual disabilities located on their website in the directory. Um, and so you can search by just clicking on your state or by um, the program name or a keyword. And um, it has all of programs there listed for you. Um, it's really awesome because you can look at all of the different programs right then and there. Now, 295 programs sounds like a lot. Um, however, they're all very, very different. Um, and so the great thing about Think College is it really lays out how they're different. Um, some of the programs are based on um, dual enrollment programs, so affiliated with the school system. Some programs are two years, some are one years, some are just for students with autism. So there's a lot of different programs out there. Um, and so what I encourage you to do is they have a really great resource guide. Um, it's how to think college guide and in the college search. And it lays out um, different questions that you should look for and that you should be asking um, before choosing a program or before getting your young adult's heart set on a program. Um, and so in their directory, they have the cost of the program, um, how to apply uh, if the program has any financial aid available, number of students, contact information, um, the list goes on. And so it's a great opportunity for you and your young adult or you and your students to look at the different programs that are in your area or um, throughout the country. And now um, there's actually a program in all 50 states. Uh, West Virginia uh, University just announced, um, I guess I didn't say just announced, but I guess it was like three months ago that they are starting a program um, and so there will soon be a program in all 50 states. And so for educators, um, there is great resources that you can start implementing in your classroom. Um, so lessons on how to help your students and your parents start thinking about going to college. Um, there's even resources for how to help your administrators start thinking about going to college. 
there are suggested IEP goals, uh, which would be a great resource for y'all to check out as you're writing your IEPs. Um, what are some goals that we can include? Um, there's uh, lots of um, technology tools that they suggest to start using in the classroom as we're talking about, you know, iPhones or, or uh, smartphones and things like that. But there are also a lot of other um, technology tools that uh, Think College suggests, uh, along with um, foundational skills for a career in college. Um, and there is uh, uh, person-centered planning is also on there. Um, and so person-centered planning really should start in high school. Uh, that is a student-focused uh, plan where the student runs their IEP meeting and talks about their goals and their long-term outcomes. Um, and so they have uh, resources on there as well. Um, now, I think college has numerous webinars and trainings that are free for teachers and parents. Um, so I really suggest signing up for their monthly newsletter. That way you can keep up to date on the events that they have. Um, and then for for families, do you want to go to the next slide? Or oh, someone sorry, else? I'm on it. No, you're fine. <laughs> uh, so for families, uh, they have a, as you can see on there, the whole tab of family resources. Um, so one thing that we would really suggest families to start thinking about is paying for college. Um, our programs are not cheap. Um, and so what are some ways that we can start thinking about how we're going to afford college and these programs? Um, they have IEP goals that you should advocate for your student to have in their IEP um, and how to go about advocating for those things in the IEP meeting or with the teacher beforehand. Um, some things that you can do to help start prepare your young adult for college, um, both at home and uh, things at school. And then it also talks about um, there's a, a great resource on there about uh, the application process for programs like uh, um, all of ours. Uh, and it's actually called It Takes a Village because it really does take a village. All of our admissions are uh, rather long and there's recommendations you need. There's certain paperwork that you're going to have to have in the school system. Um, and so going ahead and looking at that and looking at who um, who do we need to reach out to to help us in filling out these applications? What documents are we going to need? Um, so that's a great uh, PDF that you can check out on their website. They also have, um, you know, how to start talking to your transition teacher and the administration in those IEP meetings about going to college. Um, and, and a lot of times that is advocating for your young adult. Um, Lastly, a great resource that they have on there is the differences between high school and college. I really strongly suggest you check out that resource. Um, it's pretty comprehensive. Um, so one side it has, this is what happened in high school, but this is what happens in college. And it really breaks it down. Um, again, as I was talking earlier, a lot of times uh, families are very shocked by the differences uh, when their young adult goes to college. And so um, that document does a great job of breaking down how do the accommodations change? What happens to modifications? Uh, what are things that our student needs to advocate for? Um, so it's, that's also a great resource. And something I'd like to point out real quick about the Think College website is there's a lot of information. So it can sometimes appear overwhelming, but everything is so well organized and you can put a search engine in. I mean, you can do the search and it'll bring up everything you need. And you can also like um, separate it out by resources or programs, um, webinars. So you can really narrow it down to what you're looking for. So anytime you have any question, if you put it in to their search engine, I promise you, you will get an answer because it's just, a, it, it has a plethora of knowledge. Or if there's a resource that you can't find, Think College is really great about responding. Um, yes. They have a contact us and I, they, we get contacted really quickly and so do our families if they ever contact them. Um, and so if there's something that you can't find or you're not sure what resource would be the best to use, um, go ahead and contact Think College uh, by email or through their contact us tab. Um, because they're really great about providing those resources to you and showing you what's the best one to use on their website. 
So the next um, major resource that we wanted to present is actually the Zero Center for Learning Enrichment website. There are over 100 tools, um, primarily for teachers to use to teach transition related content that is embedded on our website. So I strongly encourage you to go check it out. Please then follow the Zero Center on social media. We are working on new things to push out through tools and webinars and different things that we have going on. So we also have, we will be hosting in September. It is a webinar specific to the Zero Center on just the resources that are embedded on our website, but there is a lot of transition related resources for, for teachers on our website. We also have transition related t-shirt um, resources for middle school and elementary school teachers. And so too often we start thinking that transition is a high school thing or a secondary thing. Absolutely not. The earlier we start, the more our students can be prepared for those outcomes such as going to college. And so we definitely have some resources that are very specific to elementary teachers and starting early. I want to highlight two resources that are our most popular resources today. The first one are the Me Lessons for Teaching Self-Awareness and Self-Advocacy. This is, the Me Lessons are our most downloaded resource. It is an absolute complete curriculum that has 10 different units. Each unit has multiple lessons in it, but all focused on teaching self-awareness and self-advocacy. So helping students understand what their disability is, helping students understand how their disability impacts their learning, impacts their different avenues of their life. And then how do I advocate for myself? So, so as previous presenters were discussing, you know, it's really up, for the, up to the student to go up to their professor and talk about the accommodations that they need. However, that can be really hard. And so the more we can do to help, teach, to help our students learn how to advocate for themselves when they're still in that K-12 setting, the more successful they're going to be at advocating for themselves after they leave high school. The other resource I wanted to highlight was the Choice Maker curriculum. Now the Choice Maker curriculum has three different components. I wanted to take a couple minutes to highlight two components of the Choice Maker curriculum. The first one is the self-directed IEP. There's a lot of research that shows that students who are more involved in their IEP meetings exhibit more self-determination, exhibit more self-advocacy, and then have greater outcomes after high school. The actual involvement in the IEP or ARD meeting um, takes so much skill level. Students have to be able to understand what their disability is. They're introducing themselves. They're talking about the accommodations and modifications that they may need to be successful in the classroom. And so through the self-directed IEP is a curriculum that can help teachers get students more involved in that IEP process to the point to where the student is leading their own meeting because in reality the IEP meeting is about that student and so in order for the student to get the most out of it they need to be directing their own meeting. The other curriculum that I want to highlight within Choice Maker is Take action and what take action is is a goal setting instrument a goal setting process so most highly functioning adults um, know how to set a goal and so I've, I've picked on the goal i used a few years ago my son came home from school and said i want to run a 5k and i said well this is not going to work you are too young to run a 5k by yourself how is this going to work? So somehow I got nominated to run a 5K with him. So I literally used the take action plan on myself of saying my goal is to be able to run a 5K with my son. What do I need to do to get there? And it takes you through all the different steps of how do you set a goal and how do you put that goal into place? So a lot of successful adults can do this independently, but a lot of our students and not just students with disabilities, but just a lot of students in general need some explicit instruction on what does it mean to set a goal and what does it mean to make that goal happen. Take action is something that we use with our students in Sooner Work. So 
I have an assignment due in two weeks. What am I going to do to make sure that assignment gets done? And so you can set both short-term goals and long-term goals, but teaching students a process to both articulate their goal and making their goal happen is a critical skill that they will need not only to be successful in college, but just successful in life in general. So I now want to introduce Dr. Lauren Bruna, who has joined us. And so Lauren, if you would like to introduce yourself real briefly and then talk away. Yeah, perfect. So um, I'm Lauren Bruno. I am a postdoc with the UI Reach program at the University of Iowa. And I am going to present to you right now on uh, two resources out of Virginia, um, which is um, where I earned my doctorate. Um, and the first is the I'm Determined um, website. And so this uh, resource is a joint project between the Virginia Department of Ed and, um, excuse me, uh, the Partnership for People with Disabilities um, at VCU. And this one really focuses on how to use uh, self-determination and it provides resources for families, teachers, and individuals. And so um, as you explore their page, you can go to the resources tab and on the resources tab, it provides templates, PDFs, and everything that are super editable um, that you can use in your classroom right away. One of my favorite resources um, that they use that you can use in IEP meetings um, or just when talking with families and parents are their transition guides. And so they really focus them, um, break them down by the areas of independent living, employment, um, community engagement. And so with those, it gives them checkpoints of different stages of um, the student's development and what they could be considering, what the activities they could be doing. Um, and things like that. So as an educator, these are things that you can implement right into your teaching and classroom. One of the most common resources I use on this page is the goal planning template. Um, it gives you a structured set on how to write a SMART goal by measuring student outcomes, um, and it's to support the student in writing it themselves. One of the things that they're most well-known for is their uh, self-determination summit in the summer. And due to the pandemic, um, it's being uh, offered virtually this summer, but it's uh, sessions for students, families, and educators to go and learn more about how to support students in developing self-determination and offers workshops for um, individuals with disabilities to develop those uh, self-determination skills as well. And so um, it provides direct instruction um, and really um, empowers individuals to take ownership of their own lives um, and provides the resources for parents that they can implement in the home and community to do that as well and how to best support the student in becoming independent. Uh, so it's a really great resource um, and I encourage you to check it out. If you cannot edit the PDFs. Again, you can adapt them. I find that they're really easy to use, um, make them adaptable. And then they also um, provide other uh, components like posters you can use in your classroom, like the elements of self-determination chart um, and things like that. And I found it really useful, user-friendly and simple to navigate. So um, I definitely encourage you to go and check this one out. Next is uh, VCU's uh, Virginia Commonwealth University Center on Transition Innovations. And so this offers a plethora of resources from videos, um, from experts in the field to um, articles you can read or just even under transition topics, providing an overview of what these transition specific areas really are. Um, and provides, <coughs> excuse me, um, it also provides professional development opportunities. As you can see, uh, there's courses um, students can take, but also uh, professional development opportunities for teachers too. Um, so under the training tab, it offers a ton of online courses that you can use to support students um, in being successful with their transition, as well as other publications um, 
and then other additional resources. So this one's a really great one. It's very comprehensive um, and there's a ton of things to explore under each of those major tabs. All right, so on the next few slides, we are going to let each program kind of talk about specifics to their program um, and what they're looking for and all of those kind of things. So I think first up, and these are in alphabetical order, so we're not showing any bias here, but first up is Texas a and University and Aggie Achieve. All right, thank you. So at Texas A&M, we are the Aggies and um, Achieve stands for Academic in higher inclusive education and vocational experiences. Much easier to roll that together and say achieve. And that's really because that's what we want our students to do. Um, at Texas A&M uh, welcomed our first cohort of Aggie Achieve students this past fall, 2019. We had five students who were pictured here. And um, Aggie Achieve is important because it's the first four year residential program of specifically for young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So, um, you know, as you saw on the Think College map, there are lots of different programs in every state and what sets Aggie Achieve apart among the many other excellent programs in Texas is that um, our students live on campus. They come for four years and they are fully enrolled uh, students and they receive a certificate in interdisciplinary studies as their credential at the end of the program that comes from Texas A&M University. And Aggie Achieve was designed uh, with two important pillars of our mission. The first is to provide an inclusive and immersive college education. So as I said, our students are fully enrolled as Texas A&M students. They have access to everything that um, any other A&M student has. So they live on campus, they go to the dining halls, they go to the rec center, uh, library, computer services, writing center, all things like that, all the resources that are already built in. Um, conceptually, um, when designing this program, I wanted to create as little as possible and um, rather than creating new things specifically for our students, just expand access to all of the great resources that the 65,000 plus students at Texas A&M already have. Uh, the second piece of that is immersion. And so uh, we work hard to create a fully immersive experience for our students where they are plunged deep into the uh, culture of Texas A&M from the beginning. So just an example, um, our uh, freshmen at Texas A&M typically attend an unofficial orientation called Fish Camp. And um, as somebody who did not graduate from Texas A&M, it was pretty foreign to me and figuring out what that was. But as soon as I started developing this program, I realized, okay, if they're going to be a part of the Aggie experience, they need to be a part of Fish Camp. And As someone who did graduate from Texas A&M University, Fish Camp is really important. Yeah, it's like a rite of passage, right? <laughs> there you go. Um, but typically non-degree seeking students don't go to Fish Camp. Um, they have, you know, other types of orientation things, but, you know, our students are four, they're there for four years. They start off as freshmen and um, for, uh, the fish, the term fish is the term for freshmen, and um, you know, they come in as fish. And so last August, our five students attended fish camp. It was optional for them, but they all wanted to go. And it's uh, typically held at um, a campsite uh, about an hour, hour and a half outside of College Station. And they lived in the cabins there, um, which are really nice, by the way. Uh, Olivia and I got to go visit, and it was, it was really cool. But what was so cool is that when we got there, we, we had trouble finding our students because they were just so fully immersed in the, the cheers and the games and the group activities that were going on. They did not stand out. They were not, um, you know, doing something off to the side by themselves. They were fully immersed. And what was so cool is that that the relationships they developed there have lasted since then. And um, was a really important part of their college experience. So that's just an example of something that's super integral to Texas A&M um, to have that college immersion. 
Um, but we don't want our, um, our program to just be a college experience where you come and go and go to fish camp and have fun. Um, the equally important part of our program, if not more important, is to focus on the future. So what, the, what we don't want is that our students go back to doing what they were doing before they started Aggie Achieve. So the most important piece of what we prepare our students to do is preparing them for employment in the community. And we do this in several different ways. Um, beginning the spring semester of their first year, they have on-campus internships. Um, across different sites and uh, on campus. So just for examples, our students this past spring started out at the rec center. We had students um, uh, at Aggie Hospitality, which is like meal preparation for football event or for uh, sporting events, including football. But in the spring, it was um, supposed to be focused on basketball and things like that. We have um, students working in dining hall, working at, um, sandwich shop at the student center, the Memorial Student Center. Um, so they're all over campus and they're gaining those really valuable skills with the support of a job coach and um, with the support from program staff during their um, seminar classes where they're learning about career development skills. So um, our students focus on academics as well as employment preparation. So in addition to these internships, they're also taking classes alongside their peers without disabilities. So they enroll in Texas A&M classes. Um, they enroll for zero credit. So they follow a modified curriculum, a modified syllabus, um, where we work closely with the instructors to establish an independent learning agreement, uh, which is basically just a set of uh, shared expectations of what that student is going to do in that class this, that semester, and that measures how they're evaluated in the class. And in addition to the um, academic classes, they also take physical education classes. So health and wellness is a really important part of our program. Even though we don't have the all-you-can-eat Chick-fil-A, we do have plenty of other delicious and not so healthy options um, on campus. So we try to integrate choice making as much as possible and um, how to balance that if you're going you know, to, to eat well, to also um, exercise and take fitness classes. So in addition to just going to the rec center, our students also enroll in a class with the physical education activity program, which is um, basically any type of group fitness class you can imagine, sports, basketball. We had students take fencing, we had yoga, all different types of dance. Um, the, I mean, the physical education program has just opened it up to them and said, whatever they wanna take, we're gonna find a way to make it happen. And Overall, that's really what we've seen at our university with that, that spirit of inclusion and welcoming to our students. And Olivia is gonna talk more about what that inclusive and individualized support looks like. Yes, so as Carly was saying, our students are working on a certificate in interdisciplinary studies from Texas A&M. And so this is a um, certificate recognized and given by the university. Um, not by Aggie Achieve, which is really awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, our students are enrolled in their courses. They are taking them for zero credit because they have so many modifications. But when they graduate from Aggie Ach or from Texas A&M with, with a certificate, um, they'll also be able to have a transcript that shows all of the different courses that they took. Um, so that's really neat. And one of the ways we try and keep our program individualized is we use a person-centered planning approach. Um, which I mentioned brief, uh, briefly mentioned earlier, but this is uh, student-centered. Um, and so it's really run by the student. Um, it's about twice a year where the student um, holds a meeting. They invite anybody they want to invite that they feel like will su like supports them um, both now and will su continue to support them in the future. Um, and the student talks about you know, what classes they wanna take, what um, internships they're interested in, their long-term goals, where they want to be when they graduate, um, their independent living, their social skills, leisure and recreation. Um, and so the student is really driving, um, you know, their program um, and their, their instruction. And so um, one funny story I want to say is that when our students first entered the program, um, during their first person center planning meeting, 
you know, I was like, you know, who do you want to invite? You can invite anybody who you feel like supports you. Um, and they said, well, you know, I think I'll just invite my, my parents. I said, are you sure? Like there's no one else? No, I just, I just want to invite my parents. And then for the next meeting, after being on campus, you know, who do you want to invite? And they named every single friend or person they met on campus. And it was this huge list of people that they wanted to invite. And then I said, well, do you want to invite your parents? And they said, um, yeah, I mean, I guess they can come too. <laughs> so it was like a total switch, which was really cool um, to see that they felt so supported and that they um, have made such great friendships and relationships. Um, and so we do provide a lot of um, accommodations and modifications in the classroom to meet all of their individual needs. Um, you know, students receive services from disability resources on campus, but they also receive a modified syllabus um, similar to what Kendra was saying about, you know, if they're expected to do a five page paper, they might submit a PowerPoint or an audio recording or video recording to show what they learn. Um, they are responsible to do the same assignments as everyone else. They're just showing their learning differently. Um, and then again, you know, with employment internships on and off campus, we certainly want our students to graduate it with gainful employment. Um, we do not want them leaving our program and going back to what they were doing before. Um, and so we're really uh, driven by employment focused um, and that increases as they go through the program. So by the third and fourth year, they're working more along the lines of a part-time job um, in the community. And then helping them find that job when they graduate, whether that is um, here in College Station, some of our students never wanna leave, um, and, or whether it's um, wherever they're from. Uh, and so really bridging that gap. Uh, a lot of our support though comes from Aggie Achievemates. Aggie Achievemates is a student recognized organization at Texas A&M. Um, this was uh, made at the same time as Aggie Achieve, but as student run. Um, and uh, this has been a really unique aspect. Um, and so we have undergraduates and graduate students from across disciplines so these are not just College of Education students, they're um, from each college throughout the university who um, just want to support our students across um, campus and across our different areas of focus. And so um, this past year, we had over 130 Aggie Achieve mates. Um, so other Texas A&M students that wanted to get involved with our program. Uh, we, are, we just finished up our first year, so we had five students. Um, but next year, we uh, will welcome uh, 12 students. We'll have 12 total. Um, and each year, as we um, take more cohorts, we'll grow. Um, but it's been really neat to see the relationships and the lifelong friendships that Aggie teammates have made um, with our students and their students with them. Um, you know, some of them have gone home over the holiday to meet their families and um, really is a supportive and more natural experience. We don't pay them, they don't get any volunteer hours. They just want, they just enjoy being friends with our students. And so that's been a really cool aspect. They have workout partners, dinner partners, academic tutors, daily living or daily planners, and um, general members who just, you know, hang out with them or take them to the grocery store. Um, and so this picture at the bottom of the screen is um, during like a, a matching event. So they had a scavenger hunt around, around campus and they didn't know who their um, Aggie Achieve student was going to be. They were told to wear a certain color. Um, and so then they all ended up seeing, you know, who they were paired with and things like that. So it was really cool. Um, our students did finish the semester up online. Um, and so that's, uh, that was an interesting transition. Uh, but I will say that they did a pretty good job of making that transition using Zoom and, and things. Um, if you want to learn more about Aggie Achieve, I do suggest you go to our website. It will be on one of the last slides of this uh, presentation. Um, and then sign up for our monthly newsletter. Uh, that's a great way to keep up to date on Aggie Achieve. Uh, we also do open houses for parents and educators. Um, right now, we don't have any scheduled because of COVID-19, but we do have one recorded. We also have a webinar just for educators um, about how to prepare your students for post-secondary programs in Aggie Achieve specifically. Um, and so those are on our YouTube account um, that we'll, we'll share at the end of this presentation. All right, so next we have the University of Iowa REACH program. 
Hi, hey, yeah. Um, I um, am here with Jennifer Kramers uh, from UI Reach, and Reach stands for Realizing Education and Career Hopes. We have been around for 10 years now. We were one of the first to receive uh, TIPSID funding uh, back in 2010. Um, well, our first cohort graduated in 2010, so they began in 2008, actually. Um, but we are a comprehensive transition program at the University of Iowa, serving students ages 18 to 25 years old um, with intellectual, cognitive, and learning disabilities. Uh, we offer an integrated Big Ten college experience. So being on a Big Ten campus, um, similar to Texas A&M, big campus, big sports, lots of activities. Um, and so that is definitely what our students embrace. Um, but our main focus is we want to empower um, students in the UI REACH program to become independent, self-determined individuals. And so to do that, we use person-centered planning. Um, <clears throat> we, we really focus on that integrated college experience, um, but also offer um, proper supports modifications um, and accommodations to students as needed in um, accessing um, inclusive courses, career development, resident hall living, and everything. And so um, for resident hall living, we have uh, REACH specific RAs on our floors um, that students can go to. Um, These floors are integrated with other students in traditional residence halls. Um, but we just um, have an additional RA on the floor that students um, can use as a resource. Um, students receive services from SDS. And um, then again, we have a large focus on preparing um, students to become competitively employed upon graduation. So Jennifer is gonna talk about all those specific um, on the next slide, but don't click yet, Kendra. But we, <laughs> uh, we currently have, um, about 60 students enrolled in UI Reach. So each cohort welcomes about 25 students, um, 25 to 30. And then um, it's a two year certificate program and then year three and four are optional. So we have about a 50% retention rate for a year three. Um, and so with that um, students enter, we have about a staff close to 20 um, that support our students and um, uh, each student is a oh, excuse me. Each student is assigned um, an individual advisor, which helps them in identifying um, activities they want to participate in on campus, um, academic advising, uh, you know, social life, navigating all of that. And so, um, we are looking to expand and everything, um, and continuing to grow and evaluate our program. Um, but our main focus is offering the integrated Big Ten College experience um, where students feel included and part of the University of Iowa. Jennifer, do you have anything to add before we go to the next slide? Uh, well, we have students from over 17 different states. So we have uh, students that we have a lot of students from Iowa, but are, I would say we have probably a higher percentage of students that are out of state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a majority of our students, um, I think, come from Illinois and Minnesota, and then uh, we do have students from anywhere from New Jersey, Maryland, all the way to Washington, California, um, Arizona, Colorado, um, Canada. We, Canada um, <laughs> we pull from a bunch of different locations, and so um, our students bring a bunch of varying backgrounds and experiences as they enter UI Reach, and then um, by providing that individualized support. Um, and person-centered planning approach, then uh, we can make their college experience what they want it to be. All right, so you can go to the next one. So I'll try and uh, be concise in this one. This is typically something that I would spend two hours on our, our tour, what we do with families and, and educators. So I'll give you a, a condensed version, but we do offer um, virtual tours for folks now that we are uh, kind of all virtual. So those are some opportunities that you can uh, look at our social media and find dates for that. Um, but so we have three core areas that we focus on in our program, academic, student life, and career. And we have specific staff assigned to each department. With the academic, everything is student-centered planning and students make goals in all three core areas. Um, 
And that's kind of monitored and facilitated through the individual student and their REACH uh, advisor. We have integrated and inclusive uh, courses that students can take. They can take our classes for credit, audit, um, pass, fail, but typically the classes that our students choose to take are based on, on their um, individual plan. So there's a lot of variety in classes that, that students are able to access at the university. Um, we have some UI Reach specific uh, program courses that our students take. We have kind of a core set of classes that students participate in, um, and those are typically with self-advocacy, social skills, independent living skills. We have some computer and tech, uh, financial planning and personal budgeting um, to kind of enrich that transition experience uh, for the students. Um, student life, so I talked earlier about all the programs uh, that they have on campus and organizations that they can participate in. Um, students are able to have uh, mentor support. So if we have a student that's interested in maybe the video game club, but they're a little hesitant with the navigation or just uh, going to the club alone. Uh, there are student mentors that will uh, attend those clubs with them the first couple of times to get them comfortable with the navigation and, and getting that natural support um, within that club. And then typically students are, are pretty actively engaged. I would say our students might be uh, more engaged in campus activities than our neurotypical students. And one uh, might be because one, they have more um, uh, support to that, uh, more encouragement, but also they don't have as much homework, right? So uh, our, our homework for our students is to be involved in the uh, community and campus. So um, we really do make that a high priority with our students. And they certainly do embrace that with not only the, the student organizations, but also with uh, the sports that are available on campus as well. Um, and then for the career part, so uh, we have specific career curriculum that goes through um, each year that the students with us, they have career exploration and kind of an internship prep during that first year where they're building some workplace readiness skills and taking some career assessments and kind of beginning to build that career path that they're interested in. And then that allows us to develop internship sites for the students for um, the remaining years that they're with us. The students will have a community or campus internship. Uh, we have paid internships and some unpaid internships. And we really match it to the student's career path, but also to the student's ability. We don't want to put them in a position where they're not going to learn and be challenged by new skills. Um, and we want to put them in an area that's going to kind of uh, build their experience so that then when they do graduate, they will be um, competitively employed. So to assist with that, we are offering certifications and um, uh, education and training that's going to help students in their career path. So we're able to offer students serve safe, food hand handling, allergen certification, CPR, first aid, um, and we are also implemented uh, this spring the ACT work keys um, curriculum and testing. So with that, students can take the uh, ACT work keys assessments in applied math, um, workplace documents, and applied literacy. And they can, if they score a three or higher, they get in what they call an NCRC, which is a National Career Readiness Certificate. It's uh, recognized throughout the country as um, workplace readiness skills at each level. So uh, the minimum level for an NCRC is a bronze level. Uh, we had over half of our students the first time qualify for that bronze level, which was really exciting. We had students score also silver and gold. And so for students, that kind of gives them an added um, uh, credential that they can take with them when they're uh, on their job search because employers recognize the credential as um, qualifying them to have the skills to do the job. So that's been an exciting addition to our, our career program. When the students uh, prepare to graduate from our program, whether it's the second year, the third or the fourth year, 
they have a transition meeting, which is really exciting. It's a little bit about what you spoke about earlier when, you know, do I invite my parents or not? Um, our students invite uh, their whole circle of support. It also will uh, involve if they have a VR counselor or a case manager, we bring all the folks involved, but it's really not set up as an IEP meeting. It's set up as uh, an opportunity for students to celebrate their college experience and accomplishments, their certifications, and then they have developed specific goals, short-term and long-term goals in uh, career, education, independent living, and community engagement. And so the whole circle of support is able to kind of be around the table or this, uh, this spring be on the screens together with Zoom. And the student is able to really articulate where they're going after they leave our program. As you said earlier, we don't want students just to leave and go back and live at home. We want students to, to move forward with the skills they've learned. And you saw the, the statistics earlier that showed the growth and why post-secondary education can be a powerful uh, life changer for our students. Um, and we're gonna share on the next slide some of our statistics too. We don't want students just to leave and then um, fall back onto where they were at before they came to us. So having these specific goals in each of those areas and having their um, circle of support there to, to assist them in, in their action steps to meet those goals, I think is an important way for them to continue that growth and development after they leave us. We do have a full-time position, a staff that is the alumni support specialist, and they will make contact throughout um, the year to assist the student in accessing any resources or promoting any additional action steps to help the students make those goals. So I think that's a really special um, support that we have for our students that even after they graduate, we're able to, to have that um, resource for them. So we'll let Lauren, you can talk a little bit about the um, statistics that we got back from our latest uh, alumni outreach. Had to unmute. Sorry. So yeah, so as Jennifer mentioned, we have a full-time alumni support specialist. So we have a saying at University of Iowa, once a Hawkeye, always a Hawkeye. And so we have currently over 175 graduates um, that our alumni support specialist um, over this past year has reached out to to gain a better understanding of, hey, after you I reach, what are you up to? What are you doing? Um, and everything. And so um, we are pleased to say 88% of our graduates are employed, uh, competitively employed, um, <clears throat> in that 55% um, of them um, are working part-time, um, a little less than 30 hours a week, um, and that 37% are working 30 plus hours a week, um, more in full-time positions. Um, of the 141 um, individuals we did connect with, 8% uh, did not choose to respond. But of those that are employed, 37% um, received benefits, um, and 14% of those were not sure uh, necessarily um, if they were receiving benefits, um, and then additionally 9% chose not to respond. But if we look at the pay here, um, a majority of our graduates, um, <clears throat> about 50%, um, are making 10 to $14.99 an hour, um, and then followed by um, 26 of them stated that they were making at least minimum wage. And so um, we're seeing that our graduates are working, um, and then if we're looking on the other side of this slide, are more than half are living on their own or with roommates. Some are still choosing to live at home with their parents, um, and that is a decision they are making independently, um, but that most are relying on natural supports in their home and community. Um, and so they're having those independent skills and relying on those natural supports, just like any um, neurotypical um, individual would. Um, and that 24% um, are utilizing supported community living supports, about a quarter um, of the alumni we followed up with. But as Jennifer stated, um, at the end of our program, we now have uh, the transition meetings with specific goals and action steps and people assigned to support with those goals. So our alumni support specialists will now, um, now that we have a baseline understanding of where our graduates are at, 
We'll work with each individual alumni um, that has recently graduated to do follow-ups with them um, about meeting those specific targeted goals, um, have they met those specific action steps, connecting with um, members of their circle of support, including VR counselors, um, SCL providers, and everyone to ensure that the student is meeting those action steps. And then if additional supports are needed, um, providing either resources in their community um, or locally in Iowa City um, and providing those reach out so that they still feel connected to our program that they're feeling supported to meet their ultimate goals. Um, some of their goals um, are from six months from now for short term um, and up to 10 years for their long term. And so he'll continue those continuous follow ups to ensure um, students are becoming as independent as possible as they would like to be. And so um, we um, we have tons of um, Carly and Olivia mentioned their YouTube channel. We have tons of testimonies and um, videos about our students' internship experiences. Uh, two that are highlighted are we have a student who interned with our basketball team, um, and he has some specials on Big Ten Network um, focusing on him. And then also uh, we have a student who worked for our local TV news station who um, he um, has a whole thing about his internship experience, as well as other parent testimonies and everything. And so um, while we can tell you all about the data and what our programming is, uh, hearing it from the stakeholders, I think is so valuable. And so we encourage you to go check those out um, and really hear um, from the people um, that are the students and the families um, that are, you know, um, part of our program. And then um, Kendra will share a link later. If you are interested in learning more about UI Reach or anything, please, um, we have a virtual educator tour day uh, beginning at one o'clock Central Standard Time here. Um, and so you're more than welcome to join that. She'll share a link with a follow up later. Um, but if you're interested in reaching out, we have family tour days, virtual tour days coming up on June 15th. And we are so excited if you want to join us um, to learn more about UI Reach and what we offer. All right, so um, we're now going to talk about SoonerWorks at the University of Oklahoma. Um, WORKS actually is not an acronym that stands for anything. Um, we just like SoonerWorks because it works. Um, we do have a four-year college program. It is very similar in some nature to the other programs that were described, so we don't want to necessarily rehash things. Um, but we also have some, of course, unique features for Sooner Works. So, all right, Mendy, it's all you. Okay. So, like to talk. Um, so Sooner Works just started this year. We started really small. We have three students. Um, we were, we just gained approval. I think it was the end of May of 2019, and then we started in. Uh, August of 2019. So it was really fast paced, but I feel like we had an amazing year and the students were very successful. Our parents really enjoyed it. As Lauren said, the stakeholders, you know, their view is a huge part of the program and they were all really happy. And I will say um, our students exceeded our expectations. The parents kept reaching out to us and saying they're doing this and they're doing that and they're so excited about everything. But we, I felt like we went in with really high expectations, Kendra, and then they would exceed them and go beyond every single time. Like it was just amazing to watch. And so when you see our pictures of the uh, Sooner Works, it's the th same three students. We're not just highlighting our favorites. Like it's the same three students and everything because those were our participants this year. They had varying degrees of abilities and needs and all of that. So we, we did have a wide range of students in our three. And it was so fun to watch the different personalities emerge throughout the year and all the skills they gained. But really our main focus with these three students and in all future students as well is the meaningful employment and full community um, integration. We, we had really, before we even started, put that focus on the employment and the academics. Like we thought those were important. Our integrated academics and the students also coming in and working with just within the Sooner Works program. While we stressed the peer socialization and the uh, student life, 
we didn't know it was going to explode as much as it did. And I feel like our students have really taken the lead on that and pushed it. And so what I think I was most surprised by this year with our with Sooner Work students is the socialization. Um, we knew it was important, but we just didn't realize how much these students were going to grow this year. So like I said, we started small. We started with three. Um, with COVID-19, a lot of things changed. But we, Kendra, if you want to go to the next slide, yeah, and I was going to, you know, and so there's a lot of aspects to our program, which are very similar to, to, you know, to the other programs discussed. We kind of have three pillars that we do. We have the academic instruction, we have the socialization, and then we also have the employment integration. I do want to highlight one picture in the bottom right hand corner. And so this is a picture of one of our students at OU Texas football weekend. So for those of you who are Sooner fans or Longhorn fans, OU Texas weekend is the biggest football weekend of the year. Both schools meet at the Cotton Bowl Stadium in Dallas. And our student independently went with friends down to Dallas, stayed in a hotel, went to the state fair, went to the OU Texas game. And so for our students to have those kind of peer interactions where they're independently making friends. They're going to the biggest, you know, college-wide events that we have um, independently, and they're functioning just like every other student on campus is, is an absolute win for us. And we really stress that our students are Sooners, and they're University of Oklahoma students. They may be in this program, student Sooner Works, which is like I may be in this major or I may be in this degree plan. But first and fo foremost, I am a University of Oklahoma student and I am taking advantage of every single opportunity that the University of Oklahoma has to, to give me. Okay, like Kendra said, we have our three pillars. So for our college academics, for our students, there's a huge fo focus on the person-centered planning. That's also with our career development too, and I'll get to that. But for the college academics, that is the main focus of the Sooner Works program with what we're doing individually with the students. And each student, I'm meeting with them weekly, um, sometimes twice a week, and we are um, tailoring that pro that class for them that week to exactly what they're needing like one of them it was laundry we needed to focus on that for a few weeks the other one was work skills she'd never had a job and we needed to work on some career exploration and things like that uh, another student he was um well he was spending a lot of money a lot of his lunch money at starbucks and so we were focusing on that and replacement behaviors and all of that so our person-centered planning is really detailed to the students. It's goal, it's, uh, and we develop it off of goals. Um, and we initially, initially we didn't have, we did have a focus on person-centered planning, but it wasn't as big as it became the second semester because I realized our students' needs were so varied and what we were teaching them in this class is specific for Sooner Works, their needs were so varied across the board that we move to more of that person-centered focus. We still teach a few um, classes specific to Sooner Works, um, like independent living, budgeting, um, health, adult health, and all of those classes. Um, we're still focusing on those as well, but we only do one hour a week of those and then two hours a week of person-centered planning training. Uh, also within college academic, all of our students are enrolled in four to six hours of regular OU coursework. It equates to two regular OU courses, but some classes are two hours, some classes are three hours, so somewhere in that four to six hour of range. And with this, all of our students audit their OU coursework, so although it is not for greater credit, it still shows up on their transcript as the student has the material that was covered in that class. We do as much as we can to tailor their specific um, OU coursework to the interests of them. We have some courses that we require all students to take. For example, all of our students um, take a communications class during their freshman year as one of their required courses. But we work really hard to tailor interests. So for example, one of our students this year is um, 
extremely interested in music and very gifted. And I have to say to the UI Reach program, he let us know that someone in UI Reach made the band and that he was in marching band when he was in high school and wants to know when it's his turn to try out for OU Pride. And so congratulations to UI Reach. I think that's awesome that one of your, one of your students um, is, is in the band there. But, you know, so for the student who is interested in music, he took an appreciation of music class. And so for another student who is very into health and fitness, we tailored his OU coursework to their interests. And so that's kind of what fits into that college academic strand, which is both their OU coursework, which is their inclusive coursework out in the OU community, as well as their Sooner Works specific coursework and person-centered planning. Okay, and for student life, all our students are required to jo join two campus organizations. We have a student that joined a fraternity. They really seem to gravitate towards our religious organizations on campus. Um, and so we've had a lot of success with the students being involved in campus. And we also have a student organization called Peer Partners, which are kind of like our mentors for our students. And we kind of went away from the word mentors, though. We want to make sure they're partners. These students are friends. They're they are um, doing anywhere from four to five hours a week of just peer partner activities and they're going to campus activities they're going off campus they're going to the movies they really enjoy the waffle house for some reason so a lot of them are meeting at the waffle house every week but it's that socialization and we've realized the peer partners have kind of i feel like became more important in their, our students lives than the Sooner Work staff so it is it's been such an enjoyment to watch this uh, peer partner program grow with OU. Um, we also have student um, uh, student academic mentors that are helping the students um, on their weekly assignments for their inclusive classes at OU. And then moving on to career, uh, our students are all involved in the internship that very sem first semester they're there. We do not do an internship. We really want them to focus on the college life and the experience, but then we move on their second semester to a 10 hour internship. And we build those hours up throughout their participation in the program. Um, so the students are uh, working on those, we're trying to get it, they're working on the basic work skills kind of at first with the career exploration in their internships. And then we're placing them in more specific focused internships as they go that kind of meet their needs. Um, and so we are doing, we had one student who worked with our Sooner Sports Properties this year, which was, a, they do a lot of the advertisement involvement at sporting events. We had one young lady who worked with us because she's still developing those work skills. So we had her work at the Zero Center and she was working on answering the phone and just the basic work skills. And then we had another student who loves health and anything healthy and training and all of that. And he worked at our uh, health center at OU. And so he tested all the, health equipment and, and all the sports equipment. And he was so excited about that job. And I don't know too many people that would be excited for testing every single treadmill that day, but that's what he loved and it was so amazing. So we're, we have a, that other focus on career development. And then we have our university life and that's the students living in the dorms. They're living in inclusive dorms. Um, we, their first year we put them in individual dorms, but they're suite mates with one another. And that's just kind of get them acclimated and um, they're in the freshman dorms. But then as they grow with the program, they get the same um, options of, as all the OU students. They can go potluck, they can live um, with each other's roommates. They can grab a roommate that they uh, know outside of Sooner Works. And we have, we would had several students um, decide that they wanted to grab roommates that they met either through peer partners classes or they may have known for since high school. But then when it came down to it this semester, they all made their choices for next year and they all chose to live individually again. So it was interesting. I thought they would have roommates, but they decided they really liked their space and living on their own. So they're all going to single dorms again, but they'll have uh, potluck suite mates. So they are very integrated in their, um, in their, uh, dorm life. Kendra, do you want to add anything else? I know we're getting, well, I have a few minutes. Yeah, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're running out of time. Um, definitely. 
I wanted to get this slide up. I'm going to come back and put this slide up. What I really want to encourage everyone on this live webinar to do is please follow all the programs. Go to our social media, go to the different accounts that we have. You'll see that each program kind of has its own little flair and own flavor of what college looks like for, for that population. Um, but what I really, really encourage you to do is to get on all of these listservs, to go to all of the different social media, join, because that way you can stay um, abreast of what's going on in all the different programs and resources that we have to offer. Thank you to everyone on the webinar for joining today, and we will hopefully see you and visit with you soon. All right, bye-bye.